MMA Fight Corner. Uh, speaking of professional athletes, though, Joe, and guys that are friends here, we, we have an awesome opportunity to uh, talk with a professional fighter. He is going to be fighting in RFA 12 coming up January 24th from the historic and I mean this truly historic Shrine Auditorium down in Los Angeles. This is Keone Evil Genius Coke. Keone, thank you so much for joining us here today on The Corner. How are you, bud? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, it is my pleasure. Yeah, you obviously have a fairly well-known name here in, in UFC circles. Your brother, Eric, your younger brother, 13-3, and three, uh, is going to be fighting in UFC 170. But you've got your own big news here, my friend. Uh, you've signed a three-fight contract, if I'm not mistaken, with Resurrection Fighting Alliance. And you're going to be fighting here this January 24th. Tell me, how does it feel to be part of, I mean, really the biggest undercard promotion of the UFC right now? Um, it feels great. You know, I've, uh, I've been kind of relatively unknown for a while. Um, like I said, you know, most people know my brother Eric and, uh, I coached him for, you know, the earlier part of his career. Um, but, um, now I kind of get to refocus all of my, uh, energy and attention on myself. So, um, you know, I believe the RSA is, is, is a great show and it's a really obvious springboard to the UFC. So, um, for the next three years, I'm going to smash through everything as hard as I possibly can, and this is a great start. Well, yeah, you're talking about going up against Brian T. City Ortega. Uh, that'll be for featherweight gold of RFA. It was vacated, actually, by Lance Palmer, who had the title before. So what does it mean mm -hmm. for you to go ahead and fight for this vacant title? You know, this is a, this is a huge fight for me for a couple different reasons. One, I want to get out there. I want to establish myself, prove myself. And, uh, you know, I set a new goal that the UFC is, is my ultimate uh, goal. I'd like to get into the UFC and wreak havoc in there with, with my brother at the weight that he, uh, that he left behind. But, um, you know, I, I also believe that, uh, my, one of my guys, Jared, Jared demonized Downing, uh, who was the first featherweight title holder, um, I believe he lost his belt unjustly. I thought he won the fight against Lance Palmer personally. And make no mistake, I'm slightly biased. <laughs> you know what That's I mean? okay. But, uh, hey, you guys all train together, hard drive MMA. Totally understandable. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for me to not be biased. But I truly did think that he won that fight. I think he got a hometown decision pushed against him. And um, I'd like to bring that, that belt back not only because of that, but because uh, I just want that belt. I want it hanging up on my wall. You touched on the fact that you're going to you know, be at 145, but I think for RFA 9, weren't you in line to fight for the bantamweight title, and then you um, something had happened, you had to back out of the fight? That's absolutely right. Um, I'd, I'd actually signed on at bantamweight. Um, my last fight, I had made 145 pounds rather easily, and I never thought that I would do that, but... Ah, the glory of a of a healthy diet for once in my career. <laughs> Made 145, no problem. And um, I kind of overextended myself uh, committing to bantamweight. Oh. I'd never made that weight before. I'm I'm continuing, uh, obviously, to get a little bit older, and it's getting harder to cut weight for most people when they do that. But um, just watching my brother Eric cut to 145, which I believe was a, was a little bit too light considering he's huge compared to me. Um, and uh, my buddy Cliff Wright Jr. and a couple other people that just cut too much weight. Um, for a long time in the sport, I was I was watching people try to get these huge weight advantages and cut down weight for like two months. And um, that's what I I realized that's what I would have had to do. I would have had to diet meticulously for two and a half months and then cut ten pounds of water. And I, I reached a point where I was just like, you know what? If if I need a five or ten pound weight advantage, I'm not doing something right. You know, uh, five or ten pounds, if you look at somebody like Floyd Mayweather Jr., doesn't matter. What matters is, is an abundance of skill. So I said I would rather be outweighed by five or ten pounds and come in and, and represent myself that way than try to get a huge weight advantage, you know, and lower my brain fluid level and end up on a mat knocked out because uh, I tried cutting too much weight. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of that power that you have. You've got, like, four submissions all by choke, and you're going up mm -hmm. against a guy that they call T-City because he's infamous he for his triangles. So, uh, yeah. but, you know, you've got those submissions of your own. How do you think you match up going against this Black House Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt? Um, you know, I think I match up well. Um, I, I have a ton of respect for, for Brian and his team. Um, you know, I, I got into this sport watching Hoist Gracie in, in the, the very, very first, uh, um, UFC. So I have a ton of respect for the, for that family's jiu-jitsu and, and anybody they would promote to black belt I know is a legit competitor. Um, and I also know that it, you know, at this level in the RFA, 
Key City's game isn't just triangles and jiu-jitsu. This guy knows some stand-up, too. He's, he's not a joke anywhere else. He wouldn't get a title shot if he was. So, um, you know, I'm, I respect his grappling game, but I by no means am new to this. I've been grappling probably longer than even he has. Um, I, I don't know that for sure, so I can't really – you know, uh, verify that claim, but um, I'm not a I'm not a stranger to the submission game. I've won a lot of my fights on the ground. Um, I can't say that's necessarily where I'm gonna I'm not gonna jump into T City's card willingly. <laughs> um, but if it goes there, I'm not gonna be uh, I'm not gonna be a fish out of water. A lot of the times um, that I have done, uh, um, yeah, a lot of times I've gotten submissions. I've set it up with ground and pound first, so. Um, I'm in an advan- advantageous position because I've seen him fight a lot more than I think that he's seen my fight, and I've got a lot more to bring to the table, I believe. Yeah, um, something I was curious about was I noticed when I was looking over your professional career that you've had a couple periods where you've had three-year hiatuses. Uh, was there yeah. any particular reason why uh, from 2007 to 2010 you took time off and then again from 2010 to 2013? Um, yeah, two, two big reasons. Uh, the first reason was I was coaching. I started off in this sport as a coach, as a martial artist and then a coach. And, um, that's, that's really what I like to do, um, is coach people, try to positively impact their, their lives. Um, but the biggest reason was my family. Um, my kids, I, there's a lot of people that compete with kids. When I compete, I completely obsess over competition for two months. Um, I feel really like I, I obsess to a fact where I, uh, or to a point where I neglect my kids. Um, and I don't mean neglect in a, in a literal sense, obviously, but I don't get the time with them um, that I really want to. And it's really excruciating for me. So when I get done competing, it's fun and it's great. But even in all of my victories, after that five minutes of, um, you know, glory where I'm celebrating in the cage, I'm just glad it's over because I want to spend time with my family. Um, I was working a full-time job for uh, the last 14 or 15 years up until May of 2013, and um, that made it exceptionally hard for me to train the way I wanted to train and spend time with my family. Now I'm coaching and I'm training full-time, um, so even though I still feel like I'm missing out with time with my kids, and that, that really gets under my skin, um, you know, I have the ability to train the way that I want to train, and uh, and I also want to take it to the next level to show them what I got. Yeah, let's talk about that next level. A lot of the guys from RFA that have been crowned a champion have been able to move on to the UFC literally almost in their next fight. Uh, Sergio right. Pettis, Zach Makovsky, have, have you received any kind of word that if you can put on a great show that the UFC will come calling, or is it just you know what? Of... Go ahead. I've been, in, I've been in the sport for a long time, so I, I know how marketing works. I know how all that stuff is going to go down, and I also know that um, I – I believe that I got this fight because, you know, I, I am 5-0, and that's great, and I'm very experienced in the sport, and that's great, but my brother's also in the UFC, and it's a great marketing angle to have brothers that beat the crap out of people, yeah. um, including <laughs> including each other sometimes. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think that if I went out, I honestly feel that if I go out and I finish this fight in impressive fashion early, um, there's a chance that that could happen. But the RFA is such a solid position that if I, I also feel if I have to defend my title just one time, um, that I'll be in the UFC. But, yeah, there's always a chance that that could happen, and I think that the UFC would want to make that happen if I make a big splash. But I'm taking it one fight at a time. As far as I'm concerned, I've, I've got a contract with the RFA. They're a great organization. And, you know, if I go out there and finish the fight in the first round, third round, or, or you know, I grind out a five-round decision and the UFC doesn't call, it's not going to, you know, I'm not going to be crying about it, but... Um, if they do call, I will celebrate. Yeah, I'm just out of curiosity here. Uh, your brother's going to fight at 155 in the UFC. That'll be his next fight against Rafael uh, Oliveira at UFC 170. So I was curious if you two had maybe worked out any kind of plan where you're at 145, he's at 155, or is it mainly just because he's getting older and it's harder for him to make that weight? You know, there, there really was no plan at all. Um, wouldn't that be something to have brothers fight each other? We've done that before. Um, but, uh, you know, Eric was 145 pounds, and he was just, for me, in, in my opinion, he was just too big. Um, he, he cut that extra 5 or 10 pounds that really took away from his performance, um, whereas he goes off into the gym and, and dominates, you know, everybody at his weight, um, in, including me when he's heavy. He just, you know, he smashes me, and I'll just be straight out honest with that. Um, when he gets lighter, I feel like I can do really, really well against him. And I think that's just because he was cutting a little bit too much. So there was no real planning involved in it. I just think 155 pounds of his weight, 
Um, there might come a time where 170 pounds is his weight. He's he's just a growing guy. You know, he's he's really kind of turning into um, a, a big dude now. He's he's lifting. He's putting on size, and uh, 145 pounds is just too small. Where I feel like 145 pounds is a fairly easy cut for me, and I still get to retain all that pop and speed and power that he was kind of missing. You know, by cutting that extra five or ten pounds off. Uh, you're listening to the MMA Fight Corner. We've got uh, Keone, the evil genius Coke, with us here. He's fighting in RFA 12 coming up January 24th. Uh, now, I think, Joey, you've got a, a question here for Keone as well. Yeah, Keone, you have your own gym that you train out of, and I believe Steve Carl, uh, World Series of Fighting, World Weight Champion, trains there as well. Uh, you, but your brother trains with Duke Rufus and the Rufus boys over at Rufus Sport. Uh, do you ever train there? Is there any rivalry? What's the relationship like between you guys? Um, the relationship's uh, amazing, honestly. Um, uh, me and my brother have known Air, uh, known Duke from a long time. There's a, a local event here in Cedar Rapids called Mainstream MMA. And Duke was the commentator at the time, or one of the, one of the commentators for that show. And so he got to see me and, me and Eric compete for the first time, even though we'd been involved in martial arts for a while. But, um, he saw the talent there. I was going to actually go up and cross-train at Duke um, with a couple of my guys, and I had to bail out of the situation because of work. And I said, you know, hey, Eric, this is the time. you got to get up there, you know, and show Duke what you're all about. Mix it up with some of his guys, and maybe he'll have an opportunity for you. you know, well, he was hesitant at first. You know, he had a lot of things going on here, but he ended up taking that car ride up to, to Duke and uh, sparring with uh, Anthony Pettis. And Duke went – where, where'd you, you know, why didn't I pay attention to you? Where'd you come from? Do you have a manager? What's going on? And that's, <laughs> that's how Eric ended up getting his WEC shot. So, um, we have a great working relationship with, uh, with Duke and, uh, Duke's been very gracious in letting us come up there and cross train and his guys are always welcome to come to my, to my gym. Um, there's absolutely no competition. I have nothing but respect for that group and I've been really privileged to go up there, you know, once every three, six or 12 months and, and spend you know three to four three to four days up there training. I actually just did did a three or four day stint up there uh, with my brother, a little mini training camp a couple weeks ago, and it was great. I got to to spar with Sergio and and some of these great talents that they have up and coming, and uh, it's just a it's a great relationship and a great experience. I love their attitude and I love the way that they run their gym. Well, I tell you what, Keone, we, we love having you on the show here. Great interview, and, and want to invite all of our fans that don't know about RFA. Go online, check them out. Uh, the Resurrection Fighting Alliance is really one of the premier developmental leagues here for the UFC. And, of course, you're fighting January 24th, Historic Shrine Auditorium. Thanks again so much for coming on the show with us, and we'll hope to talk to you again here soon. Awesome. I appreciate it. Have a great day.